Let's play a game. How far can you get through this video before you learn something new? Please put a comment below the with the timestamp where you learn something new or the topic that taught you something new. It's really important that you understand port numbers. Doesn't matter if you're interested in cybersecurity or in networking or perhaps in other fields, a fundamental understanding of port numbers, sockets and the like is required, but let's test your knowledge. I've got a little network set up here. I'm running Kali Linux on this laptop. I've also got two Cisco routers, so router one and router two per this topology. I've also got my Windows computer. I've also got some additional devices such as an iPhone 15 and an Android phone, which I'll connect via ethernet to this topology as part of this demonstration. Some questions for you, however. Do you know the difference between a port number and a socket? Do you know what a port is? Do you know what a socket is in TCP IP? Do you know what an ephemeral port is? What's a well-known port number? What is the range of well-known port numbers? When your PC, as an example, connects to a server, which port number does it connect to and which port number does it use? And does that vary depending on an operating system? So as an example, is it different for Windows? Is it different for Linux? Is it different for Mac? Is it different for Android, iOS, as an example? So let's put your knowledge to the test. On my Windows computer, I'm gonna open up PuTTY and I'm going to Telnet to a specific port, not 23, I'm gonna to go to 19. And I'm gonna to go to IP address 17.1.1.1. That's the IP address of the Cisco router on this interface connected to router two. So connect to that port and notice a whole bunch of gibberish or characters are shown on screen. Why is it doing this? Well, this is known as charging or character generator protocol defined in this RFC or request for comments 864 in 1983. So really, really old. One of the things you need to know about TCP IP is it's been around for a long time. A lot of things have changed, but a lot of things have stayed the same. A lot of protocols that we use today were developed many, many years ago. Now this was intended for testing, debugging and measurement purposes, but it's really used today. I mean, it's not something you probably want to enable on a device. So I'll close this session and what I'll do is open up PuTTY again, but in this example, I'm gonna to connect to the serial port on my computer. I've actually got a USB to serial converter on my computer here and I've connected to the console of the Cisco router on COM6. So if I go to device manager, look at COM and LTP ports, you can see that COM6 is connected to my computer, so I'll specify COM6 there. Speed is 9,600 bits per second, and I'll click open, and that connects me to the console of router one, right at the top here. This is something that I've enabled, which you don't typically want to enable. So I'm gonna say no service, TCP small service. I'm gonna disable that service. And notice what happens now. If I open up a new session and try and telnet to port 19 back on that router, and I'll just show you the IP address of the router to show that I'm connecting to this router. Show IP interface brief shows me IP address of the router, gigabit 000, this interface here. If I try and connect to that IP address now, nothing happens. We're told that the connection is actually refused. And this is the thing about port numbers. We enable a service on a specific port number. A device such as a server will be running services. Different services run on different port numbers. This Kali Linux machine has an IP address. I'm just remotely controlling it from this laptop. Has an IP address of 10.11.102. If I try and open up a web browser to that IP address, Notice nothing happens. The site can't be reached. This IP address has refused to connect. In other words, the Kali machine is refusing that connection because it's not running a service on port 80. That's the default port that HTTP uses in this example. It's not a listening on that port and therefore refuses a connection to that port. But I can enable a service on that server to allow it to start listening and receiving connections on port 80. So what I can do is run the command sudo systemctl 
start Apache 2, put my password in of Kali. I've now started the Apache service on this machine. And what I should be able to do on my PC, so the PC on the right in this diagram, is I should be able to connect to the Kali machine using a web browser. So what I'll do now is press enter and notice a page is displayed on my computer. I can see Apache 2 Debian default page. I started a web server on this page. A web server is a service running on that server. By default, it uses port 80. And my client, which is running a web browser, by default connects to the server on port 80. We can see that by running Wireshark. So what I'll do is start capturing traffic on my PC on Ethernet port 5. A whole bunch of traffic is shown here, but I'll look for IP address equal to 10.1.102. That's the Kali PC. At the moment, I see nothing. But if I press Enter here, notice we can see a whole bunch of TCP traffic. And if we look at some of the traffic as an example from 10.1.2.103, which is my client PC, I can verify that by using the command ipconfig. This local PC has this IP address. It's connecting to Kali with IP address 10.1.1.102 with a source port of 52116 going to a destination port of 80. That server is listening on port 80. My client is connecting to the server on port 80. The client and the server need to know which port numbers to use. So the question for you is, how do they know which port to listen on and which port to connect to? In other words, how does the client PC know which port number to connect to on Kali and which port does the Apache service by default listen on? How does it know which port number to listen on? Fortunately, we can find out this information by looking at the IANA or Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Here's a list of port numbers updated very recently at the time of this recording. If we scroll through this list, we can see a whole bunch of port numbers. So scrolling down, there is Chargen, port 19, both TCP and UDP. If we go to HTTP, scrolling down, there's Telnet, port 23. Notice here they list both UDP and TCP. If we go down a bit more to port 80, you can see www, port 80. So the client connects to the server on the well-known port, port 80, because that is assigned by the IANA. But the source port used by the client is using some weird port number here of 52116. Why is it using that port number? This is known as an ephemeral or random port number. Back on the IANA's website, we can see that port numbers are assigned in different ways based on three ranges. We've got system ports, or what a lot of people will call well-known port numbers from zero to 1023. We've got user ports, 1024 to 49,151. And then we've got dynamic or private port numbers, also known as ephemeral port numbers. And then we're told that the port numbers are discussed in this RFC. Now, I won't bore you going through RFCs. RFCs are great if you go and sleep at night and you struggle to sleep, then read some RFCs, probably gonna put you to sleep. There are obviously some very interesting RFCs such as the Avian Carriers RFC, talking about how to send data using pigeons, but most RFCs aren't too exciting. But let's talk about ephemeral ports because what clients use actually varies. So on Wikipedia, they have these different ranges of port numbers that devices use. And this is something about history. Just because this is defined here doesn't mean that's what clients are actually gonna be using or devices are actually gonna be using. Notice what happened when I connected from my Windows computer to the server, the PC used port number 52116, going to well-known port 80. Now we're told that this range is suggested by this RFC and the IANA for dynamic or private port numbers. And that's actually what Windows 11 used in this example. We're told that Windows Vista 7 2008 and later used that range. Now, an ephemeral port number is only used for a short period of time. Every time you initiate a session, you're gonna use a dynamic port or private port or ephemeral port to make that connection to the server. As an example, if I open up another web browser to the server, and let's just restart this Wireshark capture. So I'll start that again. What we should see is that there are multiple ports opened to the server. And this allows the client and the server to differentiate the different sessions. So as an example, 
Here we've got port number 52425, and here we've got port 52426. So different port numbers used for different sessions. And if I scroll through the data, you'll see different port numbers for different sessions from the client to the server. Port numbers are really important at differentiating which connections are made. So in other words, I've got two connections to the server. The server needs to know the two connections to it. So it could be coming from the same PC, could be coming from different PCs. And the client, in this example, the same client receiving data back from the server, same server IP address, needs to know which session the data belongs to. Does it belong to this session, the first session, or the second session? And port numbers allow us to differentiate that. Now, just to show you something interesting before I continue, you could use Nmap for this, but I'm going to simply use an application on my phone thing which allows me to check port numbers on a server. So I could go to tools, find open ports, and I'll specify the IP address of the Kali machine. This iPhone is not connected via Wi-Fi. I've got it connected via a USB-C to Ethernet adapter. So it's actually connected physically to the network. So I'll press find open ports. And what you can see is that various ports are open on the Kali machine. Port 80, which we've already tested, SSH and FTP are enabled or available on the server. If I stop the Apache service and then run this again, what you'll notice is HTTP is no longer available because I've stopped that service on the server. What I'll do now is start the Apache service again. So service is now started on the Kali machine. So if I connect back to that page, it works. Once again, open up another session, that works but you may not want to allow connections to a specific service. Like HTTP is unencrypted, all the data can be seen, not a great protocol to use. So you may want to block connections to a specific protocol. On my Cisco router, show run interface gigabit 000. This interface is the interface that connects router one to router two in my topology. I have previously configured this line, which says IP access group 100 in. That applies an access list to the interface to permit or deny traffic. At the moment, show access list shows me that I don't have access list 100. I have access list one, which is actually used for NAT or network address translation. Notice I've got a NAT statement here that basically allows devices in my little topology to get onto the internet, but that's for another conversation. I'm going to go to global configuration mode now and type access list 100. And I'm going to deny, and this is a question for you, which protocol does HTTP use? It uses TCP. So I'm going to deny TCP from anywhere to anywhere. I could specify the Kali machine instead of anywhere, but I'll just keep it simple, denying anything going to anywhere. And the important piece here is we need to specify are we looking at a specific port number or are we looking at port numbers greater than a certain port number? In this example, I'll just specify equal rather than greater than or less than or other options. So the port number we want to deny in this example is port 80. So notice here's a whole list of port numbers. There's charging as an example. FTP, port 21. FTP data, port 20. Scrolling down, here's Telnet. And rather than HTTP, it's shown as www. So I could put in www, but I'll just specify port number 80. And then I'll say access list, if I can spell, so access list 100 permit. And I'm gonna permit everything in this example. This is an IP version four access list. So I'm gonna specify IP going anywhere to anywhere. So type end now, show access lists 100. Try that again, access lists 100. Notice we've got a permit statement already, permitting traffic from anywhere to anywhere. What I'll do is close this browser window down and try and browse to 10.1.1.102. Now it shows connected there, and that's probably because it's been cached. Notice we've got no hits against the access list. So what I'll do is open up a private or incognito browser window and go to the same IP address and notice nothing happens. We can't access that server because the traffic is being blocked. Notice six hits against that access list. Open up another tab, 10.1.1.102. We can't access that server because the traffic is being denied. 
you can't create access list rules or firewall rules if you don't know your port numbers because port numbers are used to identify specific applications such as HTTP or SSL or SSH, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very simple example of the router blocking connections to the server. The server is still running HTTP, but connections from router two to the server via router one are being blocked. In other words, connections from this PC via router two are being blocked to the Kali machine because I've configured an access list on this port gigabit 000 on router one. And to prove that, I could simply remove the access list. So no access list 100, remove the access list, type end here, show access list 100. I'll do that command again. Notice that doesn't exist. So now when I press enter, notice I can access the server because the router is no longer blocking traffic. Okay, but which port numbers do clients actually use when they connect to a server? So my PC is connecting to the server, which port numbers does it actually use? I've shown you a bit of that already. I'll specify IP address 10.1.102 again, send traffic to the server 10.1.2.103 is using, in this example, port number 49,944. Things change because my device crashed so notice there's the IP address of the PC going to the server using this port number. Back on Wikipedia, that confirms the range used by Windows devices. But what about Linux? Does Linux use that port range or does it use something else? To demonstrate that, what I'll do is let's use a different port number in this example. Let's use SSH and I'll connect to SSH on the server from both Ubuntu as well as Windows. So on Windows, I'll open up another PuTTY session, but SSH to the server, 10.1.1.102, and login as Kali, password is Kali. So LSB underscore release dash A shows us that we've SSH'd from my Windows computer to Kali. So just to confirm that, notice I'm using PuTTY on Windows and I've SSH'd to the server. And in Wireshark, if I look for traffic, notice we've got SSH traffic from this port number 4992 now, going to the destination port 22. My Windows device is connecting to the Kali machine. We can see the destination MAC address is a Cisco router because we're routing via this router to get to the server. But at the IP layer, we can see that the source is 10.1.2.1.0.3 going to 10.1.1.1.0.2. In other words, this PC with this IP address is connecting to the Kali machine. Okay, so here's Ubuntu. This is running as a virtual machine on my Windows computer. Before I continue, let's get the IP address. So the IP address of this device is 10.1.2.1.0.2. So that's gonna be interesting. We got 10.1.2.1.0.2 connecting to 10.1.1.1.0.2. Once again, the Kali machine has this IP address, 10.1.1.1.0.2. Okay, so I'll clear the screen. SSH Kali at 10.1.1.1.2. Put in the username. Notice LSB underscore release dash A. This is Kali. I've SSH'd from Ubuntu to Kali. So here's some traffic. 10.1.2.1.0.2 is connecting to 10.1.1.1.0.2 using SSH version 2. We can see the client elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange in it. So we're initiating key exchanges here. But the important piece I want to show you is the port number is 42954 going to port 22. So server is listing on port 22, SSH. Client in this example has initiated a session from 42954. So we can see that it's not using the dynamic or private port numbers or ephemeral port numbers as listed on the IANA's website. Notice 49152 also specified on Wikipedia, it's using a different range of port numbers. The thing to note is we have the theory and then we have the real world implementation. And this stuff's been around for a long time, so different implementations vary. Things have changed over time. So the source port number used by Linux is different, for instance, to the source port number used by Windows. Now, what about a client such as a phone? In this example, I'll use my iPhone and use an SSH client to connect to the Kali machine. Now, before I do that, I wanna capture the traffic. So what I'll do is capture it using Wireshark on this Windows computer. That Kali machine is actually a virtual machine running on Windows. So I'll capture the traffic going to the server and connect. And what you can see there is straight away we're seeing traffic from the phone to the Kali machine. 
I'll put in my password and log in. And notice I've logged in. So what I'm doing once again is I've connected from my phone to Kali using SSH via this USB Ethernet adapter. And I could once again use the command lsb underscore release and press enter. And we can see once again that we're running 2023.2 Kali on that virtual machine. And I've connected to it from my phone. But notice the port number used here is 58290. That is the ephemeral port or random port number that's used. So it's also in this range. Now, I wouldn't try and memorize port numbers. Just be aware that we have the well-known port numbers and there are various well-known port numbers such as 22 for SSH. I've SSH'd from a phone to the Kali machine. I've SSH'd from Windows. You can see here's my connection on Windows to Kali. The server is listening on port 22, the well-known port number. The clients use ephemeral or random port numbers to connect to the server. And that becomes important when you want to deny or permit traffic on a router as an example. So what I'll do here is create a new session and I'll simply tell net to the Cisco router rather than going via the console. So I'm on my Cisco router again. If I created an access list, so access list 100, permit TCP any any. And then created another entry, access list 100, permit IP any any. Does SSH use TCP or UDP? It uses TCP which is part of IP, but what's gonna happen here is it's gonna match that line before it matches this line. So if I do something on my phone as an example and just press enter a few times and show that access list again, notice the entries have increased. We can see the hits on the access list. If I do that on the Windows computer, let's do lsb underscore release dash A, you can see hits on that line have increased. Now, once again, on the access list, I can see the entries. An access list like this actually gives you line numbers. So I can insert lines before other entries in the access list. So, so I could say IP access list 100. It's actually extended because this is an extended IP access list. And let's say five here and deny TCP going from anywhere to anywhere equal to 22. So just to show you what I did there, I have added a entry to the access list, now denying TCP any any equal to 22. Originally we were having hits against this TCP traffic, but now notice nothing actually happens on my sessions. This session has died. I'll duplicate the session. In other words, I'm gonna try and set up an SSH session again to the server. And what we should see is hits against this line, denying traffic to port 22. Nothing's happening here. This one has now timed out, nothing happening. Connection timed out. And what we see is hits against the deny statement. If you don't understand source and destination port numbers, you wouldn't be able to create an access list like this. Now this is a very simple access list. I'm denying traffic to port 22, but I could also deny traffic from specific source port numbers. And that's typically where you would say greater than 1024 or greater than certain port numbers because system ports are in this range. We also have user ports in this range, so they've had to extend the port numbers. But you may decide to deny any port number greater than 1023 as an example, so that the whole range of user ports, dynamic ports, ephemeral ports are denied. Okay, so you've probably been waiting to know what the difference is between a port number and a socket. IBM have a great example here showing you the difference. We're told that a socket uniquely identifies the endpoint of a connection between two application hosts. And it says a socket has three parts. It has a protocol, a local address, and a local port number. Port numbers are different. They are not associated with an IP address or a protocol. We just have a port number 53, which could be DNS using TCP, or it could be DNS using UDP. A socket has three parts. So in this example, if we have a connection between A and B, the port number on this side is 1028, port number on this side is 2034. They're using TCP, they're using IP. So the socket would be the IP address of the host 967.38.96. Protocol is TCP and the port number is 1028. That combination of protocol, TCP in this example, IP address and port number is the socket. So socket A is TCP, this IP address and this port number. Socket B for host B is this protocol TCP, IP address and port number. 
We also told that socket and port are sometimes used interchangeably or as synonyms. Please note that the terms port number and socket are not like one another. A port is part of a socket, so it's one part of a socket and can be rent represented by a number like 1028 in this example that they used here. But a socket is represented by protocol, IP address or host name and port number. Wikipedia kind of show the same thing, but I much prefer that example from IBM. They say on Wikipedia that a internet socket is a local socket address consisting of the IP address and the protocol such as TCP or UDP and a port number. Especially in the real world, you're gonna do a lot of work with port numbers. For instance, if you use Nmap to scan a host, you're going to see which open ports there are. Showed you an example on a phone. So it's really important that you understand port numbers. You're gonna use them with firewalls. You're gonna use them with routers. For instance, using access lists. You're going to use it with Nmap. If you wanna scan a host to see which services are running on that host, you're gonna scan for open port numbers. I showed you an example using the phone, how to scan on the server. But Nmap is probably one of the most popular tools and I'll cover that in another video if you're interested. There are well-known port numbers that you need to know listed by their honor. What about this one? NS lookup, let's look up google.com as an example. So I'll clear my Wireshark capture. Let's clear that and do an NS lookup. We told the IP address of Google from the server. If I ping google.com as an example, notice that is the IP address traffic is sent to. Here it resolved to a different IP address. So again, NS lookup google.com, different IP addresses provided here, but that's an IP address of Google. So DNS, and notice here's the information, DNS allows us to find out the IP address of a server. Rather than using IP addresses, we use domain names. So which protocol does DNS use? It depends. In this example for doing name lookups, the protocol used is UDP. Source port used here is 64,000 going to the well-known port number 53. And then the server replies with that information. Notice how the port numbers are swapped around. If I talk to the server on port 53, using my ephemeral port 64,000 or dynamic port number or random port number if you like. The server will reply back from port 53 to my ephemeral or random port number. So notice how that's swapped around here. And we'll see that through the whole conversation. Client talking to DNS, port number is this, destination is 53. When the reply comes back, that is swapped around. So let's prove this. At the moment, we've got an access list denying TCP, but it's not denying DNS. If I created another entry in my access list, so I'm gonna go onto access list 100 and I say, let's say line number three, deny TCP any, any, not UDP, TCP equal to 53, will it affect my domain lookups? So do that again, nslookup, google.com, do that a few times. Notice it doesn't affect that because the DNS that we're using here is UDP, not TCP. TCP is used for zone transfers in DNS, but lookups like this use UDP. So go back onto my access list. Let's add an entry, line number two, deny UDP any, any equal 53. And that should be 53, not 52. So no, line number two, do that again, 53. So show access lists. There's our entry denying UDP denying TCP. If we do a NS lookup again, notice it's hanging now. Timeout was two seconds, timeout. And that's because traffic is being denied. Took it a while, but there are the hits on the line. Notice we are denying UDP traffic. In this case, DNS traffic. And notice that timed out. We can't get to the DNS server because the traffic has been dropped by the router. Okay, this video is getting really long and I've covered a whole bunch of stuff in this video. I'm actually just covering some of the basics here. Hopefully you've learned what a socket is. Hopefully you've learned what a port number is. Hopefully you've seen the difference between an ephemeral and a well-known port number. Hopefully you've learned that different operating systems use different ephemeral or random port numbers. Hopefully you've seen that when I set up a session to a server, so let's say I'm setting up a session from my client to your server, I will use a ephemeral or random port number to connect to your server on a well-known port. If your server is listening on that port and the connection is accepted, the server will receive the traffic and then it will reply back with the port numbers reversed. So if you're running a web server on port 80, 
I'll connect from say 65,000 to port 80, you'll reply back from port 80 going to 65,000. Port numbers get reversed depending on the direction of traffic. I know a lot of people will ask this, so let's do one last one, HTTPS. I'm gonna go to google.com and notice, <laughs> just realized, we are actually blocking DNS, so this may not work. So if I go to my router, notice we're getting a lot of blocks on UDP. So what I'll do is say no access list 100. Let's just remove that entire access list. And once I did that, notice I can get access to Google. Before I can connect to the Google server, I need to know what the IP address of the server is. So DNS needs to be used to find out the IP address of the server. So notice here's a whole bunch of DNS queries. I was blocking all the DNS, but scrolling down, what happens down to the bottom here is I get TCP, but then I'm getting quick. What I'm gonna filter for is destination port number equal to 443. That's the port number used for SSL. And you'll notice there is a connection from source port number 50,048 to 443. There's a whole bunch of stuff negotiated, including ciphers, application data, etc. But actually what this browser is using is Quick, And Quick is UDP, not TCP. So you can see there is a bunch of Quick information. Notice it's using UDP rather than TCP. I'll link a video below where I spoke about Quick with Chris Greer. Changes the game from what a lot of us are used to in that we are using UDP rather than TCP. So what I'll do is close my Chrome browsers and my Brave browsers and let's do this again with a different browser. Let's do Edge here and I'll go to google.com again with Edge. And what you'll notice is it's actually using Quick. But let's go to a different website. What I'll do is go to microsoft.com and let's see what this looks like. Notice we're seeing a lot of TCP and we're seeing TLS. So this is TCP rather than Quick. So scrolling up, notice we see TLS. We don't see Quick. Different protocol used. In this example, when you go to a lot of websites like YouTube, it's actually using UDP rather than TCP. Notice the port number 443. And if we scroll down, we can see, for instance, 443 going to port 5314. Same here with TCP. Here we've got certificate information for TLS 1.2. Scrolling down, we can see a whole bunch of TLS traffic. So in the real world, you have to be careful because you may think that you're using TCP port 443 for your connection to a web server, but it actually may be using Quick, especially to YouTube and Google sites. Okay, I think that's enough. I've linked the video below to my interview with Chris Greer, where we talk about Quick in a whole bunch of detail. So there's a whole hour of content there. I've also linked some other videos below where I talk to Chris about various protocols. In this video, I wanted to give you a practical example about port numbers and explain what port numbers are used for and what sockets are used for. It's important that you understand port numbers practically because you're gonna see them all over the place. Let me know if you enjoy this type of content. Hopefully you did enjoy this video. Hopefully I can create a lot more. I'm thinking about doing some more in-depth network networking type videos. I wanna make sure that everyone has a good foundation in networking. I'll do some basic networking and also some more advanced networking. Let me know what you wanna see. As always, I'm David Bumble and I wanna wish you all the very best.